Good evening and welcome to Prime. I'm Victor Okendo in for Lindsay Davis. We're coming on the air with breaking news tonight with two major global stories playing out. An attack in Moscow has left dozens killed, over 100 injured just two weeks after the U.S. warned of a potential attack. And the shocking cancer diagnosis rocking the royal family after Princess Kate disclosed her illness to the world. And that's where we begin tonight with the Princess Kate in an emotional statement released this afternoon. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. And we have team coverage tonight. Dr. Darian Sutton will break down the diagnosis and contributor Victoria Murphy with how the royal family moves forward. But first, Maggie Rooley from Buckingham Palace. Tonight, the deeply personal message from Catherine, the Princess of Wales. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally for all the wonderful messages of support and for your understanding whilst I've been recovering from surgery. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. The princess revealing her cancer diagnosis. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. Catherine, just 42, describing how she and her family have coped with the devastating diagnosis. This, of course, came as a huge shock, and William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. The princess sharing how she comforted her three young children. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too, as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. The shocking news coming just after King Charles was also diagnosed with an undisclosed form of cancer. The King undergoing surgery at the same time and at the same hospital as his daughter-in-law. The palace tonight saying His Majesty is so proud of Catherine for her courage and in speaking as she did. This is a completely unprecedented situation for us to be in this country where you have a family that's been through many ups and downs in the past few years. And now they have two family members who are very ill and the concern is for them. Catherine had been extremely private about her health and hadn't been seen in public since Christmas. Posting this Mother's Day photo with her children, Prince George, 10, Princess Charlotte, 8, and Prince Louis, who turns 6 next month. It was later found the photo was edited. That and her public absence only increasing concern over Princess Catherine's health. The absolute dominant thing for them is protecting their children. George, Charlotte and Louis, they've just broken up from school. So William and Kate can really kind of take them off right now and have them in a bubble and protect them while this news is hitting the world. The princess emotional speaking to the millions of families like hers. We hope that you'll understand that as a family, we now need some time, space and privacy while I complete my treatment. My work has always brought me a deep sense of joy and I look forward to being back when I'm able. But for now, I must focus on making a full recovery. At this time, I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. Maggie Rooley with us now from Buckingham Palace. Maggie, the palace says Catherine is undergoing preventative chemo. So we don't know yet if the cancer is still present, but do we know any more about the stage or type of cancer? 
Now, Victor, all we know right now is that this all started with that abdominal surgery in January, and the princess says at the time it was believed her condition was non-cancerous, but pathology revealed this cancer. Now, the palace isn't saying what kind or stage of cancer Catherine's currently being treated for, but Victor, we just heard from the princess in her own words. She says she is well, she is getting stronger every single day, and right now she's focusing on making a full recovery. Victor. Maggie Rooley at Buckingham Palace. Maggie, thank you. Joining us now is ABC News Royal contributor Victoria Murphy. Victoria, first off, what can you tell us about how the public is reacting to the news about the princess's health? Hi, good evening. Well, I think over here there's just really an overwhelming kind of sense, firstly, of shock. I think this news was completely shocking because I think it was the thing we were last expecting to hear because the only thing that we were told back in January when she had that abdominal surgery, there was guidance alongside that, that it wasn't cancer. So because at the time they didn't think it was. So I think the shock is the overwhelming reaction here. But then I think a huge amount of concern, a huge amount of sympathy and empathy for this woman who has three young children and who is a very popular member of the royal family. She is someone who the public here have for a long time really taken to their hearts and really feel very connected with. An understandable reaction. And what do you make of the timing of the announcement, given all the speculation surrounding her health that's been swirling for weeks now? Well, certainly we've seen speculation really start to get certainly I think a bit out of control in the last couple of weeks since unfortunately they made that mistake with the Mother's Day photograph. The timing of the announcement I think is entirely structured around the children and the fact that their children have now broken up from school for the Easter holidays and so they're able to take their children away with them into a bubble and protect them while this news hits the world. So as someone who covers the royal family, what insight can you give us about the Princess of Wales and her demeanor in the video? So I, I thought it was quite difficult to watch, actually, that video. It's quite hard to watch it without feeling really, it's very heart-wrenching, you know, and it's uncomfortable to see someone who is clearly going through such a difficult time, and but she holds it together so, so well, and I think that bravery really comes across. This is perhaps the most challenging situation that she has faced, but I think you still see that kind of prevailing, this coolness and this collectedness and this ability to be very strong about it all. Any indication, do we have any idea how Prince William is doing? Of course, we know his father, King Charles, is also undergoing cancer treatment. Now his wife. He's certainly got a lot on his plate at the moment. And I think we understand a lot more now why when he's been taking time away, hasn't had a full program of public duties, I think we can really see the context much more for what has been going on with them. And let's not forget that he and Kate really have this policy within their family life where they really want to both be very present for their children. And now when she's been unwell, he's been the one who's been really stepping up and doing that day-to-day -day side of things. And so I, I think it's difficult because he is also the future king. And at the moment, with the current king unable to perform public duties, I think we're seeing him try to balance these two things. I think he does want to and will be visible on the world stage and try to continue with that program of public engagements because the royal family is very thin on the ground now and he's a very important member. And King Charles spent time in the hospital together with Princess Kate. What do we know about their relationship? One of the things that I thought came across very strongly was in the message that King Charles released this evening. Um, it was such a personal message, such a personal, heartfelt message about the Prince of Princess of Wales's diagnosis. And you know, he releases a lot of messages on a daily basis, and they're often usually very, very formal. And I just felt that that message stood apart to me from the messages that we've seen him ever receive, and the tone, the personal tone, and you could really feel and hear that affection in the way that that message was written. And I think that says a lot about the relationship between these two individuals and how he feels about his daughter-in-law on a personal level. And also professionally as well, we've seen William and Kate really kind of step up and be a huge support to Charles as he's become king on a professional level. So I think it's, in it's incredibly difficult for them all right now because they've got the personal challenges going on within the family. And then the professional situation within the firm, as we call them, as we refer to them, and the challenges of that being on the world stage. Victoria Murphy, we appreciate your insight. We know you are going to continue to follow this. Thank you. Thank you. And
And turning now to ABC News medical correspondent, Dr. Darian Sutton. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Sutton, Kensington Palace did not share what type of cancer the princess was diagnosed with, but we do know that she had abdominal surgery in January. It was believed to be non-cancerous at the time, only for tests to later show that the cancer was present. What do you make of that? Oh, well, what I make of it is that there's details that we obviously don't know out of respect for her privacy, but what we do understand is that this abdominal surgery led to a diagnosis of cancer. Now, how possible is that? And during surgery, it's often a collaborative effort between different specialties within the hospital, including radiology, who are looking at the images to identify an abnormality, the surgeons who are investigating operatively, the pathologists who are looking at the samples taken from the surgery to assure what was the cause, and then, of course, oncologists, if in fact that diagnosis is cancer, to help coordinate care. Now, abdominal surgery and the association of abdominal cancer can be a wide variety of different causes. Uh, but what we do understand is that she's getting preventative chemotherapy. And the main goal of that is to prevent recurrence or prevent the chances of cancer coming back after removal. Obviously, we're hopeful that this is all successful for her. Is there anything else that you can tell us about that preventative chemotherapy? Uh, what else we might be able to learn about that procedure? Well, preventative chemotherapy means something different for each patient, and it also can be dependent on the type of cancer that you're talking about. Uh, you can also provide ke chemotherapy in different methods. Uh, one method, for example, is a targeted method where you localize and focus on the cancer itself. And then another is a more general method where you give the patient uh, what, what I would seem more conventional idea of what chemotherapy looks like. That's more likely to be associated to the symptoms that we commonly know and associate, such as fatigue, uh, hair loss, and weakness. Uh, it, unfortunately, we, we will never know probably the likelihood of or the causes of what led to this type of chemotherapy. But at the end, we, we hope is that this is going to be the end of that process, but there'll likely be screening and other issues or other modalities that come into play afterwards to make sure that this is successful and that there's no recurrence and that she can move on with her life. And Princess Kate is just 42 years old. It raises the issue of cancer in younger adults. The most recent report from the American Cancer Society showed a troubling spike here. Increased rates for six of the 10 most common cancers in people under the age of 50. So at what age should people really think about getting cancer screenings? Well, I think that conversation has to happen with your primary provider, and it's dependent on your personal history, your family history, and also your goals. Uh, you, when we have these conversations in general, I think they should always start when we're talking with our primary care providers regarding what type of screening is appropriate, whether we're talking about mammograms, colonoscopies, or screening for prostate cancer. All of these are really important, and I think a reminder that we have to make sure that we stay up to date with those screenings and have open and honest conversations with our providers. All right, Dr. Darian Sutton, we definitely appreciate your insight tonight. Also breaking, a deadly terror attack inside a concert hall in Moscow. A mass shooting and explosions killing dozens and wounding at least 100 others. Now ISIS has claimed responsibility for the violence. <laughs> Video shows several heavily armed gunmen, some in camouflage, opening fire on the crowd, many in their seats before the start of a concert. You can hear the screams and the gunfire. People rushing for the exits, some ducking behind their seats. The building eventually went up in flames, the halls filling with smoke, the roof collapsing. The attack is one of the deadliest inside Russia in decades, and it follows a recent warning from the U.S. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, has the latest. Tonight, terror in Moscow. Multiple gunmen slaughtering more than 40 and wounding more than 100 inside one of Russia's largest concert and shopping complexes. Video showing concert goers inside the 7,000 seat Crocus concert hall waiting for the show to begin. Ducking and screaming when the gunfire erupts, hiding under the seats taking cover in the lobby, the automatic weapons firing relentlessly. Video circulating online showing two of the multiple gunmen as they stormed the entrance to the complex, firing on patrons as they make their way inside. This man evacuated from the basement, saying the gunmen threw Molotov cocktails after the rampage. 
black smoke and flames pouring from the complex, caving in the roof. A massive response by police, fire, and the military. Helicopters dropping water from above, an unknown number of people trapped inside. Those images are hard to watch. Martha Raditz joins us now. Martha, what can you tell us about those warnings from the U.S. State Department about possible extremist attacks in Russia? Well, Victor, it comes just two weeks after the U.S. State Department warned about possible extremist attacks there, and specifically at concert venues, advising Americans there to avoid any crowded areas. An official telling ABC News tonight that the U.S. shared the intelligence with Russia that there was an imminent threat from ISIS. Victor? And Martha, we know you will continue to follow this one. Martha Raditz, thank you. Now let's bring in founding partner and Washington correspondent at Puck, Julia Yaffe. Julia, this particular venue, one of the biggest entertainment complexes in all of Russia, put it in context for us. Where is it in town? Why is it so important to the Russian people? And why do you think it was targeted? Uh, well, it is on the outskirts of Moscow and it is uh, a big, fancy concert venue. It's where the biggest stars come to play when uh, Western stars would come and play in Moscow, and the big Russian stars play as well. It was a symbol of the luxury that uh, Russia had accumulated and built up uh, over the two, two decades of Putin's power. And the U.S. Embassy previously warned about plans by extremists to carry out attacks in Moscow. Is there any reason to believe the U.S. had information that it perhaps didn't feel comfortable sharing with the Kremlin ahead of today's attack? Well, one of the last things to go after the 2014 invasion of Ukraine by Russia was counterterrorism cooperation. It lasted for many more years after that, even over the uh, strenuous appeals of people in the American intelligence community that it was useless and that it was legitimizing some of what the Kremlin was doing. Uh, shortly before you and I sat down to tape this, we got word that ISIS has in fact claimed responsibility for this attack. Um, in the hours before we got this claim, people were pointing fingers every which way at Ukraine, at the Russian state security services themselves, but now it seems uh, we have a more definitive answer. And tensions clearly high right now. There's the war in Ukraine, Alexei Navalny's death, and Putin's re-election. Do you think any of that precipitated what we saw today? Politically, inside Russia, the repressions have been overwhelming and absolutely crazy inside Russia. People are going to jail for leaving flowers uh, at makeshift memorials for Navalny, for resharing social media posts. And coming out of this election, Putin was trying to show that he is fully in control of Russia. He is the only ruler. He is undisputed. Uh, he has everything completely on lock. And this coming just five days later is a huge slap in the face. So what do you think going is going through Putin's head right now? Uh, probably words I can't say on the air. But, uh, but, but what I will say is that Look, when there have Russia has been subject to many, many terrorist attacks in the past. It hasn't for a while. But whenever there was a terrorist attack in Russia, the response was never enlightened. A, the first response was to go in into the mostly Muslim North Caucasus region of Russia with overwhelming force. People were disappeared, tortured, jailed, um, often executed in these counterterrorism operations and to crack and be the second step was to crack down at home on whatever political democratic uh, press freedoms Russians had remaining. So uh, I'm sure we'll see the latter. But the problem is that most of Russia's military is now tied up in Ukraine. So what is it going to do uh, in response to an attack like this by ISIS? What kind of military resources does it have left? to respond when everything is bogged down in Ukraine. We really appreciate the time. Founding partner and Washington correspondent at Puck, Julia Yaffe, thank you. Thanks. Still much more to get to here on Prime. The decision on whether charges will be filed against students over a fight at a school a day before a non-binary student involved died. But next, 
Some of the night's other big stories, including the moment when a group of migrants stormed a barbed wire fence in El Paso as tensions at the border grow. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, in it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do? Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. The internet can be a scary place. He had my name, my social security number, my address, and he named my husband and son. But what's happening now? Why did you decide to get married? I loved him. It's just plain crazy scary. You just bold faced lied to me and made up a whole story. Who did I marry? Is this person actually who they say they are? If you think you can't get played, just watch this. How I Got Played. This is Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Tonight, at least two people are dead after a school bus filled with preschoolers collided with a concrete truck on a Texas highway. It happened in Bastrop County outside Austin. Dozens were injured. Here's ABC's Mola Lenghi. Tonight, a harrowing scene in Central Texas. At least two dead, including a young child and more than 40 others injured after a bus filled with preschoolers crashed while returning from a field trip to the zoo. They're advising a school bus with 44 students rolled over. The incident taking place just before 3 p.m. local time on State Highway 21 in Bastrop County, outside of Austin. Officials say the bus collided with a cement truck and another passenger vehicle. Other vehicles involved, one being a concrete truck that also rolled over in a possible dead body at the location. The severely damaged bus coming to a rest on the side of the highway. Multiple helicopters and ambulances responding to the scene, including a bus ambulance capable of transporting 20 patients. That highway now expected to be closed for hours as authorities clear the wreckage. Well, Victor, as you can imagine, this is a developing story, still working on confirming information. But of the two victims who were killed, we know that one of them was a child on that school bus. And the second victim was the driver of that third vehicle, the passenger vehicle. Victor. All right, Mola Lenghi, thank you. And now to dramatic images from the southern border tonight. A group of migrants storming a barbed wire fence in El Paso. National Guard troops overwhelmed as the crowd pushed through the razor wire, the National Guard trying to hold them back. ABC's Maria Villarreal reports from the border about how this escalated. 
Tonight, alarming video from the U.S.-Mexico border. A group of migrants pulling down razor wire, breaking through this fencing. A handful of Texas guardsmen pushing them away as they stormed toward the border wall. Sources tell ABC News a group of migrants had been staging in this area in El Paso, waiting for Border Patrol agents to arrive. Within hours, about 500 turning themselves in to Border Patrol agents for processing. The Rio Grande River is the international boundary dividing Mexico and the U.S. along most of Texas. After crossing, migrants face these two razor wire fences patrolled by the Texas National Guard before they can reach the federal border wall controlled by federal agents. Texas Governor Greg Abbott now saying they are redoubling the razor wire barriers all while a controversial law that would allow Texas to arrest, deport, or imprison anyone they believe may have entered the state illegally is on hold pending an appeals court ruling. The razor wire, that's him. The National Guards, that's him. The Border Patrol agents still did their job, even though the governor's plans got in the way. Maria joins us now from the border. Maria, how is U.S. Customs and Border Protection responding here? Well, Victor, we've been able to confirm with CBP that they will be putting out additional resources along the affected area of the border in El Paso. But just a reminder that not everybody in that group will actually get to stay in the U.S. and plead their asylum cases. In fact, since May of last year, there have been about 600,000 unauthorized migrants that have been deported or returned back to their home country. And that is the most in one year since 2012. Victor. All right, Maria, we thank you for your reporting. Tonight in the Northeast, two powerful storms combining just as we start the weekend. Winter weather alerts from Michigan to Maine, flash flood watches from Washington, D.C., New York City to Boston. Let's get to ABC senior meteorologist Rob Marciano. Rob. Hey, Victor, yeah, these are two strong waves that are going to converge right over the east, and we've expanded the flood watches for that reason from the mid-Atlantic now up into parts of Maine, and the winter storm watches have been upgraded to winter storm warnings. You see them there in pink. Some wet snows flying across Chicago, no big deal there. Cold rain in, in Pittsburgh, that low in the southeast has been bringing heavy rain from Memphis across Tennessee into Atlanta and South Carolina. And then during the day tomorrow, there we go. They come together, and the squeeze play is on. The brighter colors indicate that's when the heavy rain is going to fall. So starting at like 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, we'll probably see some ponding on some of the highways, urban flooding. Uh, flash flood watches are posted for that reason. It's going to be dicey through tomorrow afternoon before clearing out quickly on Sunday. But it'll drop one to two feet of wet snow across northern New England. There might see some power outages. Uh, if you have a home that typically floods, you don't want to prep that home tonight. And if you can, try not to travel around the northeast tomorrow. Victor? Rob Marciano tracking it all for us. Rob, thank you. And there's a new Republican revolt in the House. Immediately after passing a spending bill to keep the government open, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene filed a surprise motion to oust Speaker Mike Johnson, who's held the post for just five months. ABC's Rachel Scott on the Hill. Tonight, with just hours to spare, Speaker Mike Johnson resisting pressure from far-right Republicans, putting a bill on the House floor to avert a government shutdown. The $1.2 trillion package passing. The resolution is agreed to. Of Democrats carrying it across the finish line. The bill provides more funding for Homeland Security, Health and Human Services, and Labor. It also included money for 2,000 new Border Patrol agents and 8,000 detention beds for migrants. Some Republicans demanding more on immigration. We got to regroup after this and get serious about some real cuts in wasteful spending and in securing the border. But House Republicans torpedoed a border bill their own party negotiated. It could all now put Speaker Johnson's job in jeopardy. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene calling it a betrayal that Johnson worked with Democrats, taking the first step to try to oust him. You're calling this a pink slip, a warning sign. The bottom line, you want Speaker Johnson out. I, well, I wouldn't have filed a motion to vacate if right, I didn't. Right, we right. need a new speaker. This is not personal against Mike Johnson. He's a very good man, and I, I have respect for him as a person, but he is not doing the job. Just months ago, Kevin McCarthy was removed as speaker after he turned to Democrats and Republicans to reach a deal to fund the government. The House was paralyzed for 22 days. I don't see how she could possibly think this will benefit anyone uh, or uh, the American people. Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. 
Rachel, tell us what happens next. Well, Victor, this is going to be down to the wire yet again. So the Senate is now racing to try to pass this bill to avert a government shutdown. As for that push to try to oust Mike Johnson, yet another speaker. Well, it's unclear how Republicans plan to move forward. The House is now out on recess for two weeks, Victor. All right, Rachel Scott, thank you. Tonight, as a Monday deadline looms for Donald Trump to post that $464 million bond in his New York civil fraud case, the former president contradicting his own lawyers. He claims he has nearly $500 million in cash after his legal team told the judge it would be impossible to secure the bond. Here's ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. All week, his lawyers have insisted Donald Trump lacks the cash he needs to secure a bond to cover a nearly half-billion-dollar civil fraud judgment. Tonight, Trump is claiming he does. He just wants to spend it elsewhere. I currently have almost $500 million in cash, Trump wrote on social media, a substantial amount of which I intended to use in my campaign. But Trump hasn't offered any proof he actually has $500 million in cash, and Trump hasn't put any of his own money into his campaign since 2016. The former president has until Monday to post a bond, or New York Attorney General Letitia James told us she'll take action. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, then we will seek judgment enforcement mechanisms in court, and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. But tonight, a potentially new source of income for Trump. Investors voting today to take Trump's struggling social media company public. His stake on paper, roughly $3 billion. And Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, with Trump media going public, does this suddenly turn things around for Trump's finances? Uh, sure could, Victor. I mean, $3 billion sounds like quite a windfall, but there is a catch. Unless Trump gets special permission from shareholders of the newly public company that will trade under his initials DJT, he cannot actually convert any of his shares into cash for six months. Victor? All right, Aaron, thank you. A tragic end tonight for the college student who went missing in Nashville. The body of Riley Strain was discovered in Cumberland River this morning. The University of Missouri student disappeared two weeks ago after a night of drinking. Surveillance cameras and police body cam captured the moments he was last seen alive. Police say there's no evidence of foul play and believe the 22-year-old accidentally fell in. Now to Idaho, where an escaped prisoner and alleged accomplice were in court today after leading authorities on a 36-hour manhunt. Skylar Mead and Nicholas Umfenauer face a long list of charges following Wednesday's brazen ambush at a Boise hospital. Three corrections officers were shot. Police believe the men killed two men in separate incidents while on the run. The judge ordered them each held on $2 million bail. A third person has also been arrested in the case. And in New York City, two alleged squatters are now under arrest following a week-long manhunt. The suspects are accused of killing a woman who walked in on them, finding them living in her late mother's home. Here's ABC's Stephanie Ramos. Tonight, authorities say the 52-year-old woman from Spain, Nadia Vitell, who came to New York City to take care of the belongings of her deceased mother, instead encountered two teenagers, ages 19 and 18, squatting in her apartment. Police say they brutally murdered Vitell and are now in custody being questioned. You shouldn't be trying to steal my house. Yes, you are. A string of squatting incidents have taken place across the country. There's a man sleeping right there. Just this week in Queens, New York, Adele Andaloro was trying to get a group of squatters to vacate this house that she inherited. When police arrived, they arrested one of the squatters, but allowed this man, who told our ABC station he signed a lease for the house, to stay. So why is it that I have to leave and he doesn't have to leave? Because technically he can't be kicked out. We need to go to court. After Andaloro changed the locks to her house, she was arrested. You're getting arrested right now? I'm being arrested. For what? For being, in for, being in my, for being in my own home. Our thanks to Stephanie Ramos. The MLB is opening a formal investigation into its highest paid star, Shohei Otani, and his friend, Ipe Mizuhara. Following Otani's claim of being a victim of massive theft because of Mizuhara, who also serves as his interpreter. The league saying its Department of Investigations has begun a formal process investigating gambling and theft allegations revolving around Otani and Ipe Mizuhara. A recent uh, ESPN report tied Mizuhara to an illegal bookmaker. He was fired earlier this week. Still much more to get to here. Coming up, 
If you're getting the sniffles already this year, you're not alone. Why allergy season is coming earlier. But next, the Mega Millions and Powerball jackpots are growing. We take a look at just how much winners could get by the numbers. People really want to know what it feels like to be a photographer. Right shoulder down. There we go. It's this yin yang of danger and this incredible raw beauty. That's his first breath. That's so cool. All right, this is it. These moments that you immortalize makes a lot of difference. There's a masterpiece everywhere. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in a crowd. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. <laughs> Only on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. me. From the 2024 campaign trail in Erie, Pennsylvania, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight's Mega Millions lottery drawing could net you almost a billion dollars. I did just say billion with a B. Where all that money comes from is this evening's By the Numbers. The current jackpot is the 10th largest ever. And it's not your imagination. The jackpots do indeed keep getting larger because in 2017, the odds of winning it all got worse. Your chance is currently one in 302 million due to an increase in the number of balls used. Case in point, there have now been 29 consecutive drawings dating back to December 8th without a jackpot winner. 45 states plus D.C., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands participate in Mega Millions. Those states are required to put 50% of their ticket revenue back into the prize pool and can spend the remaining half on things like education. Finally, if there's only one winner tonight, 
they'll have a choice to take a $461 million lump sum payment or the full $977 million jackpot as an annuity spread out over 29 years. And sorry, you still have to pay taxes on your winnings, at least 24% in federal taxes and usually state taxes too. There is still much more ahead here on Prime. Actor Patton Oswalt joins us to talk about the new Ghostbusters film out today and how he feels to keep the legacy alive. Plus, the city that's now offering, quote, guaranteed jobs to eligible students. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program. Only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. New developments over a fight at a school that happened a day before a non-binary student involved died. The desperate search for a hiker and why allergy season is coming earlier this year. These stories and more in tonight's Rundown. The Tulsa County District Attorney says it will not file charges against those involved in the Owasso High School bathroom fight the day before next Benedict's death. The Oklahoma medical examiner determined that an intentional drug overdose killed the non-binary teenager. Tulsa County DA Steve Kunzweiler says the bathroom fight was not an assault, but a case of, quote, mutual combat. The Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation are glad, claiming that the DA medical examiner and school and law enforcement enforcement officials all failed next Benedict. Officials say a 30-year-old woman who took a California day trip hike 
has now been missing for four days. Officials are looking for Caroline Meister, who left Monday morning to hike a trail near the Tassajara Zen Mountain Center in Monterey County. She was reported missing that night. Searchers say she only had enough food for the day and was not dressed or equipped to stay overnight. A government report says Pittsburgh's Fern Hollow Bridge collapsed two years ago because officials did not properly maintain it. A scathing National Transportation Safety Board report blaming the bridge failure on the city of Pittsburgh, the county, PennDOT, and the Federal Highway Administration. The NTSB says the more than 400-foot-long bridge had severe corrosion and section loss, and the city ignored many warnings to fix it before the bridge collapsed. PennDOT said in a statement it takes its over site responsibility seriously and looks forward to working to respond to the report's recommendations, some of which they've already implemented. Boston is trying to guarantee its younger residents get a summer job this year. Mayor Michelle Wu announcing that eligible youth and young adults in the city could find a paid job this summer. The program, Future Boss, will connect 14 to 24-year-old Bostonians with job openings across that city. Mayor Wu saying the program hired nearly 10,000 young people last summer, and they hope to raise that number this year. An airbag inflator defect has forced Chrysler to recall more than 280,000 of its vehicles. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration saying a manufacturing defect could cause side curtain airbag inflators to rupture and hit passengers with sharp metal fragments. The recall involves certain 2018 to 2021 Dodge Charger and Chrysler 300 models. Many Americans already suffering from itchy eyes and a runny nose, and it feels too early in the year. Higher pollen counts appearing sooner than expected, triggering more seasonal allergies for millions of Americans. Research indicating that climate change has created longer and more intense pollen seasons. The warmer weather letting plants leaf and bloom earlier and spread their pollen sooner. Actor Patton Oswalt, you know him from shows like The King of Queens, you definitely know his voice as Remy in the movie Ratatouille, and as the narrator on ABC's The Goldbergs. Oswalt, now featured in the new film Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, it's out in theaters today. Our Phil Lipoff sat down with him to get his thoughts on the franchise's 40-year history and the future of the movie industry. could bring about the end of humankind. Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, legendary franchise, yeah. 40 years in the making. I was mm -hmm. a little bit younger than you when I saw it, but yeah. I wanted to be a Ghostbuster. Right. Um, and, and this one, why so important to bring back you know, Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray, and even Slimer? Can I be of any help? I think mainly because they really leaned heavily into the horror aspect of this again. The scary stuff is scary. Do you believe in ghosts? I have never <laughs> once had a supernatural encounter and it drives me crazy because everyone around me that I know has had encounters with the netherworld and I could not be more open to it. I, I believe in ghosts. I'm very, very upset with them for not ever visiting me. They called themselves Ghostbusters. According to these hacks, they saved the world. I remember when I was a kid, I had the costume like everybody else. Mm -hmm. um, were you a fan? I was a huge fan, and I, I saw it right when it came out in 84, and I saw it in a way that I don't think people get to see movies anymore where go in, don't know much about it. I remember I'd seen the poster, and the poster was just that symbol of the no ghost. That's right. There wasn't online constantly dissecting every moment. You just went in and uh, let's see what this is, and blew me away because I yeah. didn't know what to expect. And people forget the opening five minutes of the original Ghostbusters is flat out scary. <laughs> so you don't know that it's a comedy at first. So your career. It's been amazing. It's <laughs> really, tell oh. us how amazing it's been. Uh, I mean, I've been, look, I've been really <laughs> lucky, man. I got, to, I got to be in Ratatouille. I got to be in a Pixar movie, for God's sakes. Run! I've gotten to, do shows like Justified and Veep. Like, I've, I've been very lucky in that I've gotten to do things that I am a fan of, that I myself am emotionally wrapped up in. People are like, is that, are you the rat and rat? I'm like, I am. Or I'll have people go, 
oh, you're you're in Ratatouille. Could you do Remy? I'm like, I'm doing him. This is, <laughs> this I'm is, actually, you're hearing him right now. When That's I go voice. out to dinner with my wife, yeah. I'm doing Remy. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> this is what I do. I wanted to ask you about the character you play in this new Ghostbuster yeah. movie. It, how much of you is in this scientist? Because you're an actor, you're a comedian. How much of you goes into this particular character? Well, I mean, I'm a big bookworm, and I do like reading about not just history, but kind of border history, border science, that moments where you know we're, we're kind of butting up against maybe not quite the natural world. Um, big Lovecraft fan, big Stephen King fan. All that kind of went into this character who is, he's enthusiastic to maybe get to encounter the, the supernatural. Um, I will leave it up to the viewers. You have to go watch it to see what happens to him. Right. But it was really, and also, getting to do scenes with Dan Aykroyd. That orb is a magical prison for a phantom god. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine, I grew up a fan of the, the franchise as well, and yeah. now you're in it doing scenes opposite him. Oh, Mind-blowing? Uh, also, like, yeah, in mind-blowing, and then seeing him, because he Ray Stance is a version of Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd is very much into the paranormal, uh, the supernatural. Uh, that like he he loves that whole world. So he very much knows when a, a lot of the stuff that they say in the in the original Ghostbusters movie was stuff he riffed because of things he knows. So when he talks about oh, wow. the, the 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 Tukunska incident in 1909, that's a real thing that happened, and he riffed it on the on the spot. The death chill. The power to kill by fear itself. Tumultuous year of strikes, <laughs> oh, uh, God, for yeah. sure. And you are in both the SAG after and the Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. Does the future of Hollywood and entertainment now feel, look more bright to you? Right now, to me, the future of Hollywood and entertainment looks very bright because things seem so dire right now. Mm. It's out of the most mm. dire moments when Hollywood has hit a wall that then. Um, new innovation and new stuff forward. Late 80s, the, the blockbuster thing hit, hit a wall, uh, and then suddenly Batman comes out, Do the Right Thing comes out, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, and everything gets, so it happens over and over and over again. We're going through this thing now where, oh my God, the pandemic, no one's going to movies anymore, Barbie and Oppenheimer happen. You know, Is it like, out of necessity, or is it time for <clears throat> creativity? What is it? You, you have to come to a point of, uh, we may as well, I mean, what's, what, what do we have to lose right, at this nothing point? Nothing else is working, let's do it. And then that's when the innovation starts happening. That's so cool. Our thanks to Phil and Patton Oswalt for that. Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire just opened today. It's playing in theaters nationwide. And we turn now to well-known social media influencer and mother of six, Ruby Frankie. She pleaded guilty in December to, to abusing some of her children in a case that shocked even followers familiar with her strict parenting techniques. Tonight, a new 2020 investigation will show never-before-seen footage of her children when they were rescued and the moment Frankie herself was arrested. Here's a sneak peek of Juju Chang's report. It's a hot summer morning in the Kayenta neighborhood of Ivins, Utah, when a ring camera picks up a young boy, not wearing any shoes, approaching a home. He rings the doorbell. Hey, how are you? Wondering if you could do your trick favors. Well, what are they? Uh, taking me to the nearest police station. Well, actually, just one to five. What's going on? I have a seat there. Nine, one, one, tell me exactly what's happened. I just had a 12-year-old boy show up here at my front door asking for help. And he's uh, said he had just came from a neighbor's house. He's emaciated. He's got tape around his legs. He's hungry and he's thirsty. We need the police to get down. Does he know his mom? Name? Ruby Frankie is mom's name. Nearly five months after her son prompted that chilling 911 call, a remorseful Ruby Frankie atoning for her actions, which rocked her family and shook the nation, pleading guilty to four counts of child abuse. And to count six aggravated child abuse. With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. 
the Utah mom of six was a popular mommy vlogger behind the since deleted Eight Passengers YouTube channel. Ruby gained over two million subscribers, infamous for her tough love parenting style. I'm going to take the scissors, look at me, and I'm gonna cut its head off. Grandma will be so mad. But by August 30th of last year, it had turned far darker. Her youngest son had escaped, wounded and malnourished. We're referring to this 12 year old boy by his initial R to protect his identity. R tells police he has other siblings who could still be in that house. Didn't know if another sibling was in the same state of condition or possibly even dead in the home. We didn't know. Police learned that house doesn't belong to the boy's mother, but to someone named Jody, Jody Hildebrandt. I'm Jody Hildebrandt. And I'm Ruby Frankie. Jody is Ruby's business partner. In police body camera footage being seen here publicly for the first time, Jody. police arrive at the house looking for out. other children. I have my turn. That's great. Step out of the house. We're whoa, 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 whoa. We're just going to stay the office. We entered a room that had a bed in it with an attached bathroom and an attached closet. And there sits the youngest Frankie child, who we refer to as E, the only other child found in the home. You come in, my buddy. I am a police officer. For hours, officers try to coax this child from the closet. I says, I bet you like pizza. But she nodded her head. Not long after, Ruby arrives at the home and is arrested along with Jody, but she doesn't say much. I can wait all day, so it's up to you if you want to talk to us about what's going on. I'll wait till I have a lawyer. Ruby and Jody both plead guilty to the same charges and could spend up to 30 years behind bars. You can watch 2020's full investigation, Ruby Frankie, Momfluencer to Felon, when it streams tomorrow on Hulu. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Victor Okendo. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of today's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, the latest from the royals as Princess Catherine reveals a personal health battle and why she kept it secret. And we talked to a former astronaut about the wonders of being in space and the growing discussion about the mental toll it takes. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane. Celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2. Only on Hulu. You should see me. The strongest 
females fight for the survival of their families. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening and welcome to Prime. I'm Victor Okendo, in for Lindsay Davis. We're coming on the air with breaking news tonight with two major global stories playing out. There's been an attack in Russia, but it's the surprising cancer diagnosis rocking the royal family that kicks off our show tonight. After Princess Kate disclosed her illness to the world, the princess delivering a taped message to a global audience describing the shock of her cancer discovery, the early stages of her treatment, and the impact it's had on her young family. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. Today's video sending a ripple effect throughout England and the world as millions of well-wishers hope for Kate's recovery. And it comes just two days after hospital staffers in London were reportedly investigated for trying to access Kate's records. A week after she was spotted at a farm shop with Prince William, almost two weeks following that Mother's Day photo that was so heavily edited, it had been removed by news agencies around the world. And more importantly, today's news comes almost two months since Kate had her successful planned abdominal surgery and hospital discharge, although now is when her fight truly starts. Maggie Rooley has more from Buckingham Palace. Tonight, the deeply personal message from Catherine, the Princess of Wales. It has been an incredibly tough couple of months for our entire family, but I've had a fantastic medical team who have taken great care of me, for which I'm so grateful. The princess revealing her cancer diagnosis. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. Catherine, just 42, describing how she and her family have coped with the devastating diagnosis. This, of course, came as a huge shock. And William and I have been doing everything we can to process and manage this privately for the sake of our young family. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. The princess sharing how she comforted her three young children. As I've said to them, I am well and getting stronger every day by focusing on the things that will help me heal in my mind, body and spirits. Having William by my side is a great source of comfort and reassurance too as is the love, support and kindness that has been shown by so many of you. It means so much to us both. The shocking news coming just after King Charles was also diagnosed with an undisclosed form of cancer. The king undergoing surgery at the same time and at the same hospital as his daughter-in-law. The palace tonight saying his majesty is so proud of Catherine for her courage and in speaking as she did. This is a completely unprecedented situation for us to be in this country where you have a family that's been through many ups and downs in the past few years and now they have two family members who are very ill and the concern is for them. Catherine had been extremely private about her health and hadn't been seen in public since Christmas. Posting this Mother's Day photo with her children, Prince George, 10, Princess Charlotte, 8 and Prince Louis, who turns 6 next month. 
It was later found the photo was edited. That and her public absence only increasing concern over Princess Catherine's health. Then she was recently seen in this video captured by TMZ. Catherine and her husband, Prince William, grocery shopping near their home in Windsor, where she had been recovering. The absolute dominant thing for them is protecting their children. George, Charlotte and Louis, they've just broken up from school. So William and Kate can really kind of take them off right now and have them in a bubble and protect them while this news is hitting the world. But for now, the I'm princess emotional speaking to the millions of families like hers at this time. I'm also thinking of all those whose lives have been affected by cancer. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. Our thanks to Maggie Rooley. Joining us now is ABC News Royal contributor Victoria Murphy. Victoria, first off, what can you tell us about how the public is reacting to the news about the princess's health? Hi, good evening. Well, I think over here there's just really an overwhelming kind of sense, firstly, of shock. I think this news was completely shocking because I think it was the thing we were last expecting to hear because the only thing that we were told back in January when she had that abdominal surgery, there was guidance alongside that, that it wasn't cancer. So because at the time they didn't think it was. So I think the shock is the overwhelming reaction here. But then I think a huge amount of concern, a huge amount of sympathy and empathy for this woman who has three young children and who is a very popular member of the royal family. She is someone who the public here have for a long time really taken to their hearts and really feel very connected with. An understandable reaction. And what do you make of the timing of the announcement, given all the speculation surrounding her health that's been swirling for weeks now? Well, certainly we've seen speculation really start to get certainly I think a bit out of control in the last couple of weeks since unfortunately they made that mistake with the Mother's Day photograph. The timing of the announcement I think is entirely structured around the children and the fact that their children have now broken up from school for the Easter holidays and so they're able to take their children away with them into a bubble and protect them while this news hits the world. So as someone who covers the royal family, what insight can you give us about the Princess of Wales and her demeanor in the video? So I, I thought it was quite difficult to watch, actually, that video. It's quite hard to watch it without feeling really, it's very heart-wrenching, you know, and it's uncomfortable to see someone who is clearly going through such a difficult time, and but she holds it together so, so well, and I think that bravery really comes across. This is perhaps the most challenging situation that she has faced, but I think you still see that kind of prevailing, this coolness and this collectedness and this ability to be very strong about it all. Any indication, do we have any idea how Prince William is doing? Of course, we know his father, King Charles, is also undergoing cancer treatment. Now his wife. He's certainly got a lot on his plate at the moment. And I think we understand a lot more now why when he's been taking time away, hasn't had a full program of public duties, I think we can really see the context much more for what has been going on with them. And let's not forget that he and Kate really have this policy within their family life where they really want to both be very present for their children. And now when she's been unwell, he's been the one who's been really stepping up and doing that day-to-day -day side of things. And so I think it's difficult because he is also the future king. And at the moment, with the current king unable to perform public duties, I think we're seeing him try to balance these two things. I think he does want to and will be visible on the world stage and try to continue with that program of public engagements because the royal family is very thin on the ground now and he's a very important member. And King Charles spent time in the hospital together with Princess Kate. What do we know about their relationship? One of the things that I thought came across very strongly was in the message that King Charles released this evening. Um, it was such a personal message, such a personal, heartfelt message about the Prince of Princess of Wales's diagnosis. And you know, he releases a lot of messages on a daily basis, and they're often usually very, very formal. And I just felt that that message stood apart to me from the messages that we've seen him ever receive, and the tone, the personal tone, and you could really 
feel and hear that affection in the way that that message was written. And I think that says a lot about the relationship between these two individuals and how he feels about his daughter-in-law on a personal level. And also professionally as well, we've seen William and Kate really kind of step up and be a huge support to Charles as he's become king on a professional level. So I think it's, it's incredibly difficult for them all right now because they've got the personal challenges going on within the family. And then the professional situation within the firm, as we call them, we refer to them, and the challenges of that being on the world stage. Victoria Murphy, we appreciate your insight. We know you're going to continue to follow this. Thank you. Thank you. Also breaking tonight, a deadly terror attack inside of a concert hall in Moscow. A mass shooting and explosions killing dozens and wounding at least 100 others. Now ISIS has claimed responsibility for the violence. The attack is one of the deadliest inside Russia in decades, and ABC's chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raditz, has the latest. Tonight, terror in Moscow. Multiple gunmen slaughtering more than 40 and wounding more than 100 inside one of Russia's largest concert and shopping complexes. Video showing concert goers inside the 7,000 seat Crocus concert hall waiting for the show to begin. <laughs> Ducking and screaming when the gunfire erupts, hiding under the seats taking cover in the lobby, the automatic weapons firing relentlessly. Video circulating online showing two of the multiple gunmen as they stormed the entrance to the complex, firing on patrons as they make their way inside. This man evacuated from the basement, saying the gunmen threw Molotov cocktails after the rampage. Black smoke and flames pouring from the complex, caving in the roof. A massive response by police, fire, and the military. Helicopters dropping water from above, an unknown number of people trapped inside. Our thanks to Martha. Also tonight, at least two people are dead after a school bus filled with preschoolers collided with a concrete truck on a Texas highway. It happened in Bastrop County outside of Austin, Dozens more injured. Here's ABC's Mola Lenghi. Tonight, a harrowing scene in Central Texas. At least two dead, including a young child, and more than 40 others injured after a bus filled with preschoolers crashed while returning from a field trip to the zoo. They're advising a school bus with 44 students rolled over. The incident taking place just before 2 p.m. local time on State Highway 21 in Bastrop County, just outside of Austin. Officials say the bus was struck by a concrete truck and another passenger vehicle. Other vehicles involved, one being a concrete truck that also rolled over in a possible dead body at the location. The severely damaged bus coming to a rest on the side of the highway. Multiple helicopters and ambulances responding to the scene, including a bus ambulance capable of transporting 20 patients. And our thanks to Mola for that. Now to dramatic images from the southern border tonight. A group of migrants storming a barbed wire fence in El Paso. National Guard troops overwhelmed as the crowd pushed through that razor wire. The National Guard trying to hold them back. ABC's Maria Villarreal reports from the border about how this escalated. Tonight, alarming video from the U.S.-Mexico border. A group of migrants pulling down razor wire, breaking through this fencing. A handful of Texas guardsmen pushing them away as they stormed toward the border wall. Sources tell ABC News a group of migrants had been staging in this area in El Paso, waiting for Border Patrol agents to arrive. Within hours, about 500 turning themselves in to Border Patrol agents for processing. The Rio Grande River is the international boundary dividing Mexico and the U.S. along most of Texas. After crossing, migrants face these two razor wire fences patrolled by the Texas National Guard before they can reach the federal border wall controlled by federal agents. Texas Governor Greg Abbott now saying they are redoubling the razor wire barriers all while a controversial law that would allow Texas to arrest, deport, or imprison anyone they believe may have entered the state illegally is on hold pending an appeals court ruling. The razor wire, that's him. The National Guards, that's him. The Border Patrol agents still did their job, even though the governor's plans got in the way. 
Our thanks to Maria. Tonight, as a Monday deadline looms for Donald Trump to post that $464 million bond in his New York civil fraud case, the former president is contradicting his own lawyers. He claims he has nearly $500 million in cash after his legal team told the judge it would be impossible to secure the bond. Here's ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. All week, his lawyers have insisted Donald Trump lacks the cash he needs to secure a bond to cover a nearly half-billion-dollar civil fraud judgment. Tonight, Trump is claiming he does. He just wants to spend it elsewhere. I currently have almost $500 million in cash, Trump wrote on social media, a substantial amount of which I intended to use in my campaign. But Trump hasn't offered any proof he actually has $500 million in cash, and Trump hasn't put any of his own money into his campaign since 2016. The former president has until Monday to post a bond, or New York Attorney General Letitia James told us she'll take action. If he does not have funds uh, to pay off the judgment, then we will seek judgment enforcement mechanisms in court, and we will ask the judge to seize his assets. But tonight, a potentially new source of income for Trump. Investors voting today to take Trump's struggling social media company public. His stake on paper, roughly $3 billion. Our thanks to Aaron. Still much more to get to coming up. Celebrating the influence of one of TV's most beloved shows 50 years after its premiere. But next, former astronaut Colonel Katie Colin explains a consequence of space missions that we often don't get to see. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. This is our combat operations center. We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag is out of care, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. I'm Aaron Katursky in Rochester, New York. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. A mission to space also means a long journey from home. It's a rewarding yet lonely part of the exploration far from Earth. A new documentary, Space, The Longest Goodbye, shares an intimate look at the reality of human behavior in isolation and what scientists are researching and developing to prepare future astronauts. Take a look. I remember when they're counting down. And then as soon as it lifts off, you can feel it in your chest. My mom is not on the planet. She's really gone. And joining us here today is a former astronaut and retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Katie Coleman. Thank you so much for being here today. You went on three missions to space. Judging by your background, we think you're on Earth. We're not sure, though. Um, <laughs> this is the question I'm sure you've gotten a million times. What is it like to see a glimpse of home every time you were away from Earth? You know, looking back, it made me actually feel, I always thought space would be far away. 
And yet when you get there, I mean, I felt no less home. It's just a home is a little bigger than we thought. And I really felt at home on the space station, but I sure missed Earth. And in the film, they also interviewed your son. Did you ever feel like a gradual change in your relationship with him while you were away? I actually still have hard, uh, a hard time watching, uh, <laughs> watching that part of the movie and not crying, actually. <laughs> you know, it's hard, uh, and, and it's been a wild adventure, really, to be part of this film and get to watch it, essentially, with my 10-year-old and my 23-year-old. And I wouldn't say that things changed so much over the course of, it was about six months that I was in space, but it's been interesting to kind of, like, in the years since, and especially this year after the film came out, kind of you know, understand what that really meant to both of us. That is so fascinating. Can't imagine what that must be like, that dynamic. Uh, the preparation and the journey it takes to become an astronaut, obviously physically challenging, but how do you mentally prepare yourself to face isolation in a confined space? Or are you ever really prepared? I mean, it's actually a huge, big place um, up there. It's the size of like the inside of a 747. So it's really big, many modules. And at the same time, you, you can't leave and you don't get to pick who you go with. And, and you don't get to have that person that you just love to talk to at the end of the day. Although we did have an internet protocol phone and that's what you uh, phone and then video once a week was what we got to do. So you do get to actually, you know, connect with those people. But you, you talked about people getting prepared. You know, how do you prepare for this? It's really exciting right now because NASA is taking applications. I'm a former astronaut. I'm retired. But they are taking applications for brand new astronauts. And I think it's a perfect time for a film like this because you might think that we're just people like you saw in those old films that you don't get to see that much of a glimpse of what it was really like for them. And to that end, did you ever feel like a sense of connection seeing other astronauts in the film who shared those similar stories as you? Absolutely, and and even looking the other way around, I've had, you know, um, military kids come to me, two of them actually, and just say, you know, my whole life I felt kind of bad that I didn't always want to talk to my dad or my mom when they were away and here was this little chance to, to talk. And yet, you know, our family, I mean, my 10 year old didn't always want to say hi to his mom on the phone, you know, and, and that, and I really wanted to, but it, you know, and so it's just human, it's just part of families. And so uh, I think finding out that we all face the same challenges and even looking at these compared to like the pandemic, and what, what that isolation was like for all of us then, you start to realize that you can make those connections. It's not the same, but it's, it's still, it's real. And looking ahead here, one more question for you. From artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and travel hibernation, what does the future look like in space travel? And how prepared are we to send astronauts to Mars? Well, I say we're not ready yet, but we are getting ready. You know, and the moon is the is the place to actually start doing that when it's three days away to, to sol solve our problems. But when it comes to, you know, how can we prepare people for, you know, when you can't have that live conversation, I'd say, you know, entertain the possibilities. I have been surprised, really, at some of the things I've gotten to take part in where I'm like, oh, I am never going to like that. It won't mean anything. And when you let it sort of in, You'd be surprised at what can make you feel better. Incredible insight. Thank you so much for joining us. We're all looking forward to this one. Space, the longest goodbye is out now in theaters, as well as streaming platforms, Apple TV and Amazon. And still to come, a prehistoric discovery by kids. Meet the group of students who made the amazing find. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. People really want to know what it feels like to be a photographer. Right shoulder down. There we go. It's this yin-yang of danger and this incredible raw beauty. That's his first breath. That's so cool. All right, this is it. These moments that you immortalize makes a lot of difference. There's a masterpiece everywhere. Ah! <laughs> Ah! 
most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, ain't it? How important it made to USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do? Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. A group of students in Santa Cruz County, California, were playing outside when they found what looked like a stick. But it ended up being the bone of an animal that has been extinct for 11,000 years, and it's being called one of the rarest fossil finds in the county's history. Reporter Jake Flores from our partner station, KSBW, has the story in tonight's Local Lowdown. This group of students discovered something that's never been found in Santa Cruz County before. A fossil of the Jefferson's ground sloth, an animal paleontologists had no idea were in this region of the state until a few curious kids unearthed it. They're building a dam, they're looking for crawdads, they're just in the mud and pulling things out and then one of them comes up and is like, this isn't a stick, this is a bone. What they discovered was a radius bone of the ground sloth. The animal is named in honor of the third president, Thomas Jefferson, after he documented fossil bones he found of this animal in West Virginia in the late 1700s. Jefferson ended up carrying the fossils with him to Philadelphia. And it's part of Americana, really. And he brought the bones of Thomas Jefferson's ground sloth uh, to Philadelphia. He carried them with him uh, when he went to Philadelphia to accept the vice presidency. An average size for these herbivores were around one and a half tons and about the size of an ox. Paleontologist Wayne Thompson says it may be one of the largest known radius bones ever found from this creature, and it just so happens to be found by a group of youngsters in the Santa Cruz Mountain. That we are so thrilled that young students were the ones who discovered this fossil. It's part of the museum's history to have young uh, naturalists, young people who are interested in looking at nature, exploring and collecting. With only one bone found, the job isn't finished for the rest of the youngsters. Does this make you guys want to look for more stuff like this? Yeah. Yes. Well, we are trying to when we go down Once to the creek. We are, trying to, yeah. we are trying to find the rest of the skeleton if it's up there. Quite the find. Our thanks to Jake Flores for that story. That's our show for tonight. I'm Victor Okendo. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. And you can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. This is ABC News Live. The crush of